Hello everyone, musculoskeletal emergency is probably the most common trauma related emergency seen throughout the world and something that everyone definitely wants to know in detail. So uh, let's have a look. So let's have a look at the musculoskeletal system. The function of musculoskeletal system is support, protection, movement and leverage, storage of mineral salts and fats, red blood cell production. So have a look at this diagram of the bone. This is a compact and spongy or a cancellous bone. So what are the components of musculoskeletal system first? Bones, nerves, vessels, muscles, tendons, ligaments, joints. Okay, exactly. So have a look at this knee joint. So you can see the bones, muscles and tendons around the knee joint. Okay, so assessment of the musculoskeletal system. So any emergency as we now know by so many emergency lectures is ABC assessment. So form a general impression, airway patency, B breathing adequate respirations, C is circulation and controlled bleeding and watch for shock. Secondary is vital signs, physical exam and more detailed exam. Okay. Continuing with the assessment, subjective data is what the patient says, patient dialogue, history and information that you can have about the patient. Objective data is scientific data gathered from the physical exam and the diagnostic exam that we do. Okay. Now the subjective assessment is obtaining history, mechanism of injury, circumstances, onset, previous exams, method or duration of treatment, relieving aggravating factors, need for assisting devices, and interferences with interference with activities of daily living. Mechanism is very, very important. So significant force is generally required to cause fractures and dislocations, direct, indirect injury, assist with anticipation of injury. A low speed car accident is much less likely to cause a life-threatening injury than a rollover accident. A gunshot wound has more potential for serious injury than a fist fight. Okay, so mechanism was the arm or hand outstretched, foosh as we call it, so fall on an outstretched hand, often a distal radius fracture. At what angle to the body was the arm, shoulder or hand on impact? Did hyperflexion or hyperextension occur? Fracture or dislocation of the area before? with the patient involved in rigorous athletic training, overuse. Assessment in subjective is pain, weakness, deformity, limitation of movement, stiffness and joint crepitation. Medications, what medications influence integrity is antiepileptics, corticosteroids, chemotherapy. Most of these weaken the bone and make the patient more susceptible to breakage. And past health history. What disease process affects the musculoskeletal system? TB, polio, infections, diabetes, rickets, rheumatoid, gout, osteoarthritis, autoimmune disease, especially the steroid use with autoimmune diseases. Okay, now let's come to the objective assessment. So inspect for swelling, deformity, shortening of limb, palpate, feel for tenderness and crepitus with movement and temperature, range of motion, passive and active, muscle strength testing, neurovascular exam, color, temperature, pulses, edema, sensation, motor functions. Muscle strength testing scale, 0 to 5. 0 is no muscle contraction. 1 is a trace of contraction is noted in the muscle by palpating the muscle while the patient attempts to contract it. The patient is able to actively move the muscle when the gravity is eliminated. The patient may move the muscle in rate 3 against gravity but not against resistance. In grade 4 muscle strength, the patient is able to move the muscle against some resistance from the examiner but is less than normal. In grade 5 is normal. Okay. Then assessment of neurovascular status is very important. It ensures the integrity of the injured area. Paresthesia, pain, pressure, pallor, paralysis, pulses. So remember these six P's, never forget it. Pain, paresthesia, pressure, pallor, paralysis, pulses. Pain, paresthesia, pressure, pallor, pulses. Okay, so 
interventions from the nursing care perspectives frequently assess document and report the six p's again pain pallor pulses pressure paresthesia paralysis okay very very important report any change in status of any of these let's have a look at the differential diagnosis the determination of which of two or more diseases with similar symptoms is the one from which the patient is suffering by systematic comparison and contrasting of the clinical findings gather all data and create differential diagnosis list determine plan of care okay so what are the diagnostic studies or procedures which help in the diagnosis obviously x-rays ct is very common arthroscopy or endoscopy may be needed arteriograms if you are expecting suspecting a vascular injury complete blood count electrolytes cross match especially in major pelvic and femur fracture urine analysis wound cultures minerals serological studies in cases of rheumatoid and other inflammatory pathologies then we have the skeletal x-ray study so standard anterior and posterior and lateral x-rays to include the joint above and below the fracture are the minimum requirement for most fractures okay so nursing responsibilities for these diagnostic exams is to remove radio opaque objects manage the pain determine pregnancy status allergies to contrast or medium should be noted administer anti-anxiety medications if they are needed responsibilities in emergencies assess and report status changes physician orders pain management and preparation for diagnostic exams preparation for surgical intervention documentation patient education next is bleeding so control the bleeding by applying pressure with a sterile dressing avoid hypovolemic shock by giving iv fluids and oxygen deformity immobilize above and below the injury site in the most comfortable position with a splint do not attempt to straighten the limb or manipulate protruding bone okay swelling apply and intermittently reapply cool packs to the injured area for up to 48 hours if needed elevate the extremity above the level of the heart Pain and anxiety, initiate oral or IV analgesia as soon as possible. Communicate with the patient, plan of care and findings. So common drugs used in pain control in musculoskeletal emergencies include NSAIDs and opiates, infection control, prophylaxis, cephalosporins, procedural situa uh, situa uh, sedation is fentanyl, reversals, naloxone. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, now we will not want to use NSAIDs if the patient is having bleeding or may not have surgery to repair the wound. Aspirin, brufen, naproxen, indomethacin are some of the NSAIDs. They use for mild to moderate pain or fever. They decrease the pain and decrease inflammation. Non-opioids. Adverse reactions are GI and renal effects. Opioids are very, very important in controlling a little bit stronger pains morphine codeine hydrocodone and fentanyl analgesia iv by mouth or transdermal decrease the perception of pain decrease reaction increase pain tolerance side effects include sedation respiratory depression constipation and a strong sense of euphoria opioid withdrawal symptoms with chronic long-term use Procedural sedation refers to a technique of administering sedatives or dissociative agents with or without analgesics to induce a state that allows the patient to tolerate unpleasant procedures while maintaining cardiorespiratory function and retaining the ability to respond purposefully to verbal commands or tactile stimulation. So that's procedural sedation. Appropriate for adult and pediatric patients, often used to sedate patients while reducing fractures or dislocations. All right, so... Procedural sedation or the pre-procedure preparation and equipment. The following equipment should be present. Oxygen and delivery devices, suction and suction catheters, resuscitation trolley and defibrillator and intubation equipment, vital sign monitor, positive pressure breathing device, appropriate size oral airway, reversal agents. Assessment of the patient should be done at baseline and every five minutes once the patient, 
once the first analgesia sedation has been given. Document vital signs, ECG, oxygen, airway, use of supplemental oxygen or not, level of consciousness, pain, medications. Post-procedure discharge criteria is vital signs and level of consciousness and respiratory status have returned to pre-sedation levels. A responsible designated adult is able to accompany. Patient or the caregiver has received appropriate verbal and written discharge instructions. Discharge forms are completed and medication has been dispensed. Pain is adequately controlled. Nausea or vomiting is controlled. Oxygen saturation is at pre-intervention status. No signs or symptoms that may jeopardize the safety of the recovery, that is bleeding. Follow-up for extended care has been provided. For children, age-appropriate responses are present. Okay. General musculoskeletal documentation includes neurovascular assessment and it includes date and time, extremity, sensation, temperature, movement, capillary, pulses, color. Any other pertinent observation, example swelling, and should always report any changes. Patient education is very, very important. Strength exercises, prevention, pain management, assist devices, cane, crutches, walker, expected outcomes, and when to return for emergencies. Now, when to return, the pain is uncontrolled by home pain, medications, ice or elevation, increase in the swelling with pain disproportionate to injury, look for compartment syndrome, vascular compromise, decreased capillary refill, cool skin, clammy, cast becomes wet or broken. Nursing interventions or responsibilities, assessment and report status changes, physician orders, pain management, education, preparation for diagnostic exams, preparation for surgical intervention, documentation, patient education. All right, so what comes under the musculoskeletal diseases seen in emergency? Soft tissue injuries, contusions, overuse injuries, low back pain, dislocations, fractures, amputations, joint injuries, arthritis. Soft tissue injuries include contusion or hematoma, dislocation, subluxation, shoulder, elbows, patella, hips and fingers, forceful high impact transmissions. Contusion or hematoma. Contusion or a bruise is when the capillary and veins are damaged by trauma and they allow the blood to seep into the surrounding interstitial tissues, skin, subcutaneous tissue, muscle or a bone. Cerebral, myocardial or pulmonary contusions can happen. Hematoma is a localized collection or pocket of blood. Now it's very, very important to understand the difference of a bruise versus a contusion. So have a look at these two diagrams. So it's a bruise versus a contusion. So on the left is a bruise, whereas on the right is a contusion. Okay, so treat a closed soft tissue injury by applying the mnemonic rice. R is for rest, keep the patient quiet and comfortable. I is for ice, constrict the blood vessels and reduce the pain. C is for compress, slow bleeding. E is for elevates, raise the injured part above the level of the heart to decrease the swelling. Remember, swelling hurts and delays healing time. Okay, next is overuse injuries. Now they are subtle and occur over time. Tissue damage happens and tears that results from repeated demand over the course of time. So we can have stress fractures, carpal tunnel syndrome, manual labor occupations, athletics. All right, let's have a look at sprains and stains. Sprain is a ligament injury. Twisting or ligament is something that attaches from one bone to another. Whereas a strain with a T is a muscle or a tendon injury. So ligament is sprain, muscle or a tendon is strain. Overuse injury and a tendon muscle. Tendon is basically a structure which attaches muscle to a bone. It can be first, second or third degree. Fibrous and muscle tears, swelling, edema, pain and decrease in function. Sprains on strains, not hugely visible in the x-ray but can be as painful as have similar healing time as a fracture. 
So in terms of sprains and strains, what we should do is assess the neurovascular status, rice treatment, immobilization, anticipate x-rays, analgesia, education, and assist devices. Educate on proper crutch technique and splint cast care. Encourage rest and when appropriate, rehab and strengthening. Return to normal activities too early before healing is complete can increase the chance of re-injury. So these are the nursing responsibilities for sprains and strains. Let's have a look at low back pain. Okay, it's very, very common. All right, so differentials of low back pain is trauma. If you had lifted something too heavy or overstretched, now we're a muscle irritation, arthritis, osteoporosis, or bone disease or lesion, infections, pelvic fractures, IV drug history. Pain accompanied by fever or loss of bowel or bladder. Pain when coughing, progressive weakness in the legs may indicate a pinched nerve or serious condition like cord equina. Low back pain, emergency nursing management, etiology, physical exam, circulation, pain scale assessment, vital signs, and medicate as per the doctor's order, urine dipstick, diagnostic imaging like x-rays or CT scan. Goals are an accurate diagnosis, relieve the pain, and increase the mobility. Okay, let's have a look at dislocation. What is a dislocation? The bones in a joint become displaced or mass misaligned. Obvious deformity, loss of normal joint motion. Localized pain, swelling, and tenderness. Sometimes a dislocated joint will spontaneously reduce before your assessment. Confirm the dislocation by taking a patient history. Right. Dislocation, ligaments usually damaged. A dislocation that does not reduce is a serious, serious problem. Numbness or impaired circulation of the limb can happen. Risk avascular necrosis is an orthopedic emergency. Avascular necrosis is bone death caused by decreased blood flow. Should assess the pulses and capillary refill, assess the range of motion, obtain an x-ray, and give pain relief. The humeral head most commonly dislocates anteriorly. Shoulder dislocations are very painful. Stabilization is difficult because any attempt to bring the arm towards the chest produces pain. Splint the joint, whatever position is comfortable for the patient. So, example of shoulder dislocation, the one on the left is where the shoulder joint is dislocated and on the right is when it's enlocated, okay? So that's an anterior shoulder dislocation. Management is realign the dislocated joint, expose the dislocated joint area, start IV access and give IV fluids, assist with the reduction, possible procedural sedation, immobilize, movement after reduction can lead to further dislocation, patient education. All right, fractures. Disruptions or break in the continuity of the bone is a fracture. Open fracture when the skin is impaired or the skin continuity is impaired. Closed fracture, skin is intact, non-displaced bone is still aligned and displaced when the bone is not aligned. We can see different types of fractures in the emergency departments. Normal, transverse, oblique, spiral, comminuted, segmental, evils, impact, torus, green stick fracture. Suspect a fracture if there is deformity, tenderness, pain, guarding, swelling, bruising, crepitus, exposed fragments, and verify it by doing an x-ray. Fracture goal and care is reduce and immobilize. Reduce is medical procedure to restore a fracture or dislocation to the normal alignment. A reduction can be an open or a closed reduction. Anatomical alignment of fractures can be by a closed reduction by the neurosurgical team traction under local anesthesia. Or it can be by open induction, where it's basically a fixation, like in surgical team where wires, pins and screws are used, internal fixation or external fixation. Or if stands for open reduction and internal fixation, as you can see in this x-ray, the ankle fracture has been fixed by plates and screws. Then we can also do an external fixation, which is usually for open fractures. Pain care, infection, risk, and pain control is very important in these. 
So this is an example of external fixator, which is usually done for open fractures or massive fractures, comminuted fractures. Responsibilities from the nursing point of view are neurovascular ass assessment, compartment syndrome, pain management, immobilization, preoperative duties, open wound care, tetanus, IV antibiotics, cover the wound. If impaled object, do not remove but stabilize. Now, very important to know is anticipated estimated blood loss with fractures femur 1.5, pelvis up to thorax 2, humerus 0.5. So major bleeding bones are because of fractures in these areas, femur, pelvis, thorax, and humerus. Fractures of the pelvis, they often result from direct compression in the form of a heavy blow, can be direct or indirect forces. May be accompanied by life-threatening loss of blood. Open fractures are quite common. Suspect a fracture of the pelvis in any patient who has sustained a high velocity injury and complains of discomfort in the lower back or abdomen. If the pelvis is unstable, which we call as an open book fracture, apply pelvic binder. Pelvic fracture with severed blood vessels can bleed large amount rapidly and pelvis can hold a large amount of blood. Open book fracture caused when right and left side of the pelvis are separated at the front and rear of the pelvis. It's an unstable fracture. So this is an example of a pelvic binder. It's placed over the greater trochanters of the two femur bones to pull tightly to secure the pelvis. It can help reduce bleeding and stabilize. Right. Cast setup and nursing responsibilities. Fiberglass, plaster, water bucket, scissors, towel, stable patient positioning. This is an example of a cast being given to the wrist. Patient education on cast care includes unusual order beneath the cast, tingling, burning, numbness of toes, drainage through the cast, swelling or inability to move the toes, toes that are cold, blue or white, sudden fever, pain, uncontrolled, no smoking. Splinting is the process of immobilizing and stabilizing the painful, swollen and deformed extremities, soft or rigid splints. Soft includes pillows, blankets, dressings or slings. Hard can be like plastic, wood or compressed cardboard. Why do we splint? Reduce pain, prevent further injury, limit damage to soft tissues, limit bleeding, help relieve pressure of blood vessels, close fractures from becoming open, easier for transport. Principles of splinting, remove the clothing from the area, note and record the patient's neurovascular status, cover all wounds with a dry sterile dressing, pad all rigid splints, maintain manual stabilization. If you encounter resistance, splint the limb in its deformed position. There are some walking aids like crutches, canes and walker, which can help to prevent further injury. Instructions of crutch should be fitted so that arms are in comfortable position to support self without resting under the arms on crutches. Place approximately 12 inch in front of you. Straighten the arms and support the self while swinging the body through the crutches in front of where they were placed. Use caution when going up or down the stairs. Traumatic amputations. Complete is total swearing of the limb or appendage from the rest of the body partial where some soft tissue is attached. Common areas are arms, ears, feet, fingers, hand, legs and nose. Example of a traumatic amputation of the hand. Surgeons can occasionally reattach amputated parts. Make sure to immobilize the part with bulky compression dressings. Do not swear any partial amputations. Control any bleeding to the stump. If bleeding cannot be controlled, apply a tunica. Now, with a complete amputation, wrap the sweet part in a sterile dressing and place it in a plastic bag. Put the bag in a cool container filled with ice. The goal is to keep the part cool without allowing it to freeze or develop frostbite. All right, joint injuries. Joint effusions, costochondritis, osteoarthritis, septic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Swollen joints happen when there is an increase of fluid in the tissues that surround the joints. Joint swelling is common with different types of arthritis, infections and injuries. 
knee fusion. So this is an example of a knee fusion. You can see the knee swollen. Costochondritis, inflammation of junction where the ribs join the sternum. Localized chest pain, reproduced by pushing on the cartilage in front of the rib cage. Often has no definitive cause and results without treatment. May be related to the chest infections or minor trauma to the chest. Often in younger populations, diagnosis can be reached after excluding more serious causes of chest pain. Differential diagnosis is chest pain and angina. Supportive treatment is anti-inflammatory medications and heat. Costochondritis is, as we said, inflammation of the cartilage. So the costochondral junctions get inflamed. All right, osteoarthritis, probably one of the most commonly heard word in musculoskeletal area. Degenerative joint disease is a breakdown or erosion of the cartilage in joints often related to obesity, injury overuse syndromes, or hereditary factors. Most common in weight-bearing joints like hip, knees, and spine. Symptoms include pain, worse later in the day, pain and stiffness after long periods of inactivity, swelling, crepitus, and warmth, may walk with a limp, bony enlargement of the joint from the spur formation is characteristic. For example, in the hand here is Herberden's and Bouchard's notes. Bunion is an enlargement and repositioning of the joints at the ball of the foot, mostly women. Treatment include wrist, alteration of footwear, foot supports, medications and surgery. Treatment is rehabilitative and supportive measures and adjunctive drug therapy. Weight loss, low impact exercise, healthy diet, assistive devices, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Septic arthritis is an inflammation of one or more of the joints as a result of infection by bacteria, virus, or less frequently by fungi or parasites. Most often, the infection begins at some other location in the body and travels in the bloodstream to the joint. Symptoms are fever, chills, general weakness, and headaches, followed by inflammation and painful swelling of one or more joints of the body. Anticipate the X-ray of affected joint, blood culture, aspiration of joint fluid is the most diagnostic modality. Anticipate antibiotics, rest, pain management. Now remember, never give antibiotics before having an aspiration of the fluid. Example of a septic arthritis of the finger. Now, rheumatoid arthritis, as we all know, it's a chronic systemic autoimmune disease. Inflammation in the joint causes pain, stiffness, swelling, and loss of function. Inflammation often affects other organs and systems of the body. Women more often than men. Usual onset 35 to 50. Can occur in children, teenagers, and elderly. So it's characterized by symmetrical polyarthritis most always affects the joints of the hands such as the knuckle, wrist, elbows, knees, ankles or feet. Usually at least two or three different joints are involved in both sides of the body, often in a symmetrical pattern. Stiffness is most noticeable in the morning and improves later in the day. So this is how a rheumatoid hand looks like. Treatment is supportive measures, nutrition, rest, physical measures and analgesics, NSAIDs, steroids due to decrease inflammation, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, immunosuppressants, TNF-alpha inhibitors. They reduce the pain, stiffness and the swelling in the joints. Example, etanercept, infliximab and adlimumab. <laughs> Rheumatoid emergencies are atlantoaxial dislocation, which is the pain in the neck, Scleromalacia perforans, which is a thinning of the sclera in the eyes. Vasculitis, acute exacerbation of rheumatoid arthritis, synovitis, infections. Life-threatening include hypovolemic shock, compartment syndrome, venous thromboembolism, infection, osteomyelitis, acute tubular necrosis. Hemorrhage, second to long bone fracture, maximize oxygen delivery. Completed by ensuring adequacy of ventilation, increasing oxygen saturation of the blood, controlled blood loss, fluid resuscitation, lactate ringer solution and normal saline, possible red blood cell transfusion, prepare for surgical intervention. 
fat embolism syndrome. What is a fat embolism syndrome? It is a form of ARDS that follows major long bone fractures. Symptoms include hypoxemia, recent long bone pelvic fractures, possible tikal rashes, and change in loss of consciousness. Embolic marrow fat macroglobules damage small vessel perfusion, leading to endothelial damage in pulmonary capillary vessels, and they lead to respiratory failure. We have to do serial ABGs, chest X-ray, ECG, primary supportive treatment, and we want early fracture fixation to decrease incidence. Compartment syndrome, the most dreaded musculoskeletal emergency in the emergency department and the orthopedics department. So it's characterized by elevated intracompartmental pressure with a confined myofascial space, which compromises neurovascular function. Causes decrease compartment size as in cast increase compartmental contents like fractures crush injuries bones surgeries or trapped injuries they usually develop 6 to 12 hours after injury and they end up needing a fasciotomy as in these pictures signs and symptoms is a pain especially with passive flexion syndrome is characterized by p's pain that is out of proportion pain of passive stretching pallor decrease sensation decrease power so we should remove restrictive dressing prepare for operative theta on surgical decompression fasciotomy elevate the injured area and notify if needed compartment pressure measurement is very very important it is done by special instrumentation by compartment pressure measuring devices which are in which basically are based upon inserting a needle into the myofascial compartment and noting the pressure. Fasciotomy is the release of this pressure, is the release of the compartmental fascia. So that's com compartment syndrome. Remember, it is an absolute emergency and the patient may lose his or her limb if it's not taken care of immediately. Osteomyelitis is an acute or chronic bone infection, risk factors being diabetes, hemodialysis, injected drug use, poor blood supply, and recent trauma. Symptoms include bone pain, fever, GI discomfort, local swelling, redness, and warmth, chills, sweating, low back pain. Clinical x-ray pictures look like this, so you can see a lot of bone destruction and in the clinical picture, you can see it's really swollen and red ankle. Treatment is by IV access, IV antibiotics. Most patients need surgical intervention and debridement. Revascularization, if things don't settle, they may end up with an amputation. This is a South African triad scale, very urgent and urgent. Very urgent if there is a threatened limb dislocation or fracture with break in skin. Urgent if the dislocation of finger or toe or fracture with no break in skin is close fracture. Important to consider geriatric age group as their bones are fragile and they have fragility fractures. They have decreased in muscle strength and range of motion. Chronic disease states in osteoporosis, loss of height with aging kyphosis, comorbidities. Pediatrics is is the second important age group. Infant bones are only 65% ossified. Long bones are porous and less dense and can buckle or break easily and can have a torus fracture. Presence of epiphyseal growth plates. Periosteum is thicker and more vascular, so the healing occurs more quickly. Vigilance of abuse is very, very important if you think something is inconsistent with the history. Parental support is very, very important. Parents are trained and become active participants in the physical therapy treatments and a child's stretching program. Nurses need to help the parents understand the time commitment involved, assess the parent's ability to monitor the child adequately for complications and confirm they understand the signs and symptoms of complications. Okay, medical legal aspects of patients with musculoskeletal emergencies. Abuse assessment is very important, multiple stages of healing, in, if there is any injury inconsistent with the history. Inform the consent in pre-surgical, patient privacy, occupational safety, health risk management and programs. 
Right, so you have a young male who has a musculoskeletal injury and is unresponsive. You will not be able to assess skin integrity, distal pulses, capillary refill, sensory and motor function. What is the correct answer? Correct answer is D, sensory and motor function, cannot be assessed without the patient being awake. Question 2. The purpose of splinting a fracture is to reduce the fracture, prevent motion, reduce swelling, or force the fragments into anatomical alignment. Answer is B, prevent motion of bony fragments. Question 3. Which of the following musculoskeletal injuries has the greatest risk for shock due to blood loss? A. Pelvic fracture. B. Posterior hip dislocation. C. Unilateral femur fracture. D. Proximal humerus fracture. Answer is A. Pelvic fracture. Tendons attach bone to bone, muscle to bone, bone to tissue, muscle to joints. Answer is B. Muscle to bone. Which medication does not affect the integrity of the musculoskeletal system? A is chemotherapy, B is anti-epileptics, C is anti-emetics, D is corticosteroids. Correct answer is C, anti-emetics. Okay. Question 6. What are the 6 P's of neurovascular assessment when evaluating a musculoskeletal injury? There are no options in this and we should know this by heart. Pain. Paresthesia, pallor, pulses, paralysis, and pressure. What are the signs and symptoms of compartment syndrome? Select all that apply. Pallor, swelling, fever, pain, out of proportion, redness, urinary tension. Correct answer is A, B, D, and E. Fever and urinary tension are not seen in compartment syndrome. Next question. Which are diseases and conditions that may affect the musculoskeletal system? Rheumatoid arthritis, osteomyelitis, gout, rickets, myocardial infarction, pyelonephritis, CVA, lupus, and gastroesophageal reflux disease, or hypertension, high cholesterol, and diabetes? Answer is A. Rheumatoid arthritis, osteomyelitis, and gout. These are all conditions which affect the musculoskeletal system. What items do you want to have available at bedside for conscious sedation? Answer is heart monitor, suction, back mass valve, oral airway, pulse oximetry, blood pressure cuff, and crash card. Next is what is the acronym for RICE and what does RICE stand for? So RICE stand for is rest for R, I for ice, C for compression, E for elevation. These are used for orthopedic injuries such as sprains or strains. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please do not forget to subscribe to the channel, comment on every video and share the videos as much as possible.